Hi, this is Dr. Vinash. Welcome back. And first of all, let me congratulate you on taking a positive step towards your learning. It was a fantastic houseful session on the past Sunday. And thanks to you all, it was such an interactive session that I thoroughly enjoyed helping you learn more about ECGs. But at Pulse Tutorials, we pride ourselves in the fact that we don't just teach our students, we see to it that we follow it up so that they become perfect in whatever they learn from us. So here's me, Dr. Avinash, helping you out with more ECG examples so that when you look at your patient's ECG, you are absolutely confident of what problem you're looking at. Before we begin this video, uh, I want you to get your ECG workbook. This is a compulsory thing for this video to really work for you. And if you're not very much 100% uh, with your concepts, I would also need you to get your notes that I shared with you in my lecture. Uh, if you don't have it right now, pause this video, go get it, and then play back from this particular point onwards. I'll wait. So I hope you people have uh, got your worksheet with you and the notes in case you need a reference. I know you people are champions and you would remember most of the things that I've shared with you, but just in case, get this too. Let's start solving a few examples from the worksheet. Now I'm going to solve and you are going to follow me so that how this works is uh, I'll give you the step-by-step -step reminder of what process you have to do and you do it with me and we get done with at least three to four ECGs in this video session itself. Let's begin. Uh, the first ECG I'm going to have a look at is ECG number one, which is going to be solved in exactly the same method I taught you in the classes. The first thing is to have a look at the long lead, but oopsie, there's no long lead here. Not to worry, we'll still be using our eight step formula to find out if there's anything wrong with the patient's heart. Let's begin. Our first step in our eight step formula was finding out the rhythm, but there's no long lead here. So finding rhythm is really, really difficult because using two or three beats um, in, in a very small ECG does not really give you much idea about the rhythm, but you can still go ahead and find out the distance between two P waves uh, and compare it with the next P wave using the paper method that I showed you. And if you don't remember it, no worries. When you come for the next lecture on diabetes, I will see to it that you know exactly what I'm discussing right now. Uh, for people who are not very comfortable with the rhythm using a paper method, you can use your compass and try to find out. You can use a scale and try to find out the distance between two, three, four consecutive P waves. And similarly with R waves, rhythm pehle pata karo. And uh, as I am using a piece of paper and I'm marking it here. Hmm. The rhythm is regular. So, there's no problem with regular. I have used lead one because there are four um, T waves, uh, QRS complexes, sorry, and uh, four P waves where I could easily check the rhythm uh, seems normal. Second point of our um, eight step formula was rate. Now let's talk about the rate. Remember, I gave you three different methods by which you can calculate the rate. The first method was the 10x method. Now for the 10x method, you require 30 big boxes. And the problem with this particular ECG that I have shared with you is the fact that there's no long lead. Not to worry, there are two more methods of fighting the rate. Let's move on to the best ever method, the 1500 by RR method. Let's calculate the distance between two P waves the number of small boxes are what we are calculating. Let's count. Do P waves ke beach mein, I think 14 chote boxes hai. So using our 1500 by RR method, 1500 divided by 14 would be around, you can use your calculators if you want, around 107, 110. So that is the rate of uh, this person's P waves. Let's calculate 
QRS complexes also, the RR interval. Now, if you calculate the boxes between two consecutive R waves, they also are 14, which means every P wave is followed by a QRS complex and the atrium and the ventricle are synchronous. They're beating in a normal manner. The next thing that we can use to calculate the rate was uh, my favorite formula, the 300, 150, 100, 75, 60, 50 method. So if you recall that method, I want you to use that method and tell me which number, how many big boxes are between two consecutive P waves and two consecutive R waves. And if you do this properly, you will notice that uh, the distance is approximately two and a half to three boxes. And using our formula, three boxes is 300, 150, 100. So this patient has a heart rate of above 100 which is exactly what we calculated by our uh, 1500 by RR method. So this guy has tachycardia, that's for sure. Good. The next thing that we have to check is P wave. Remember three by three, the PR interval, how many boxes? Yep, you guessed it correct. It should not be more than three to five small boxes. Let's have a look at QRS complex. Well, beautiful they are they are narrow complexes not more than three small boxes wide they have no m pattern no w pattern in any of the leads that i'm seeing here ideally you should only be focusing on the long lead but because we don't have a long lead here i'm just giving you an overview of it the t waves are a little smaller but they are upright so that's good there is no st segment elevation or depression just as we planned there's no problem with the QT interval and as I look at all the leads every single wave that we expect to be there is there and there are no other abnormalities as of now so our eight step formula has been used successfully at this point of time your mind says I can't calculate the rhythm that's fine but using lead one the four uh, waves that you can see the rhythm seems normal the rate is above 100, there's no abnormality in P wave, PR interval, QRS complex, T wave, ST segment and the QT interval and there seems to be no more surprises. Which then of course brings us to the second part of our ECG which is the 12 lead ECG which uh, is uh, very much uh, given in your worksheet. So let's have a look at the 12 lead ECG. What do we do first? We calculate the axis. And how do we calculate the axis? I gave you two formulas. Let's use the simple one first. The simple one first was the quadrant method. Remember, the three o'clock to six o'clock is the normal, six o'clock to nine o'clock is a right axis deviation, three o'clock to 12 o'clock is called as left axis deviation and uh, nine to 12 o'clock position would be called as the extreme axis deviation. Let's do that. Let's solve it in our example so that we are absolutely perfect with this. We take lead one, we take lead AVF. Observe in lead one, the QRS complex is positive. In lead AVF, the QRS complex is positive. And when there are two positives, which quadrant does it fill? You're correct. It fills the three o'clock to six o'clock quadrant, which means this person has a normal axis. Why don't we calculate it using the more precise, the degree method that I have showed you. Okay, uh, for degree method, remember what we did? We only focused on lead one, lead two, lead three, lead AVR, AVL, AVF, right? And we found out the most equiphasic or the smallest QRS complex. Now, if you actually focus, you will notice that the smallest or the most equiphasic QRS complex is in lead three. And lead three ka perpendicular lead is uh, AVR. Have a look at AVR. AVR has a negative deflection. So uh, remember I said AVR will look from the right upper side. So if you're looking from the right upper side and the wave is coming towards you, then only you will get it positive. But this lead shows a negative deflection, which means the current is going away. And when it is going away from lead uh, AVR, it is going in which quadrant? It is going into the three o'clock to six o'clock quadrant, which again means that our patient has a normal axis. I hope everybody is with me on this one till now. If yes, 
go ahead and give this uh, video a like if you have any doubts till now please drop a message in the comment section below i am live right now and i will be able to shoot across a reply to you guys okay after we are done with the axis we then go on to check for any st elevation st depression t wave inversion and pathological q waves i hope you know when do you say st elevation or depression when do i say uh, what do i mean when i say a t wave inversion and you also know what i mean when i say a pathological q wave so do you see any of these things here not really you can also check a lead v1 to v6 notice how predominantly the qrs complex is kind of negative in v1 and as we go towards v6 it becomes more and more positive that's a normal qrs progression ye aise hi hona chahiye aur agar ye hua hai it means that the ecg is normal okay there are no infarctions bundle branch blocks nothing like that which means our ecg1 is apparently normal so how will you present this the presentation is pretty simple i have checked the ecg the rhythm is normal the rate is around 110 per minute the p waves the pr interval the qrs complex the t wave the st segment the qt interval all appear normal there are no surprises hidden in this ecg you will also say that the axis is normal axis you will also say there is no st elevation no st depression no inverted t waves no uh, pathological q waves there are no signs of myocardial infarction so now that we are done with ecg number 1 let's move on to ecg number 2 uh, in the sequence this is again using our same set of formulas the first step is to look at long lead but mm, there is no long lead not to worry we'll still be using our eight step formula let's try to find out the rhythm take your paper method or your compass and let me know in the comment section below whether you find this rhythm to be regular or not i'll take uh, you will take some time and i will wait for you guys uh, to type in the comment section below hmm the rhythm is of course regular calculate the rate um remember if you have a long lead then you might be able to use the 10x rule but because we don't have a long lead here uh, we are going to use uh, one of our other two methods uh, you can try both first let's try our 1500 divided by rr method i'm going to give you 1 minute to calculate this count the number of rr interval boxes small boxes between two r waves or you can calculate not r and you will calculate uh, this number of small boxes between two p waves if you use lead 2 the waves are absolutely crispy in this particular lead so you can actually count it uh, pretty easily mm, count fast uh, i believe um, there are around 19 boxes between two p waves or two uh, r uh, waves which means 1500 divided by uh, 19 comes to around 79 75 79 all right uh, even if you use my uh, favorite formula the 300 150 100 75 60 50 formula you will notice that um, the second r wave or the second p wave uh, falls on the fourth big line which means it's around 75 so this is a good way of calculating the rate have a look at p wave uh, focus on lead 2 p wave appears very beautifully smooth curve there's no abnormality there the pr interval is uh, normal the qrs complex um, appears narrow perfect the t wave is upright cool that's not a big issue the st segment appears pretty normal at least in lead 2 not much of a deviation there and there 
is no surprise uh, hidden in lead two at least which means things look pretty promising for our patient at this point of time now once we are done with our eight step method the eight step strategy or the eight step system that we used move on to using the 12 lead ecg what do we find first the axis which method would you prefer well uh, i would really recommend try the uh, quadrant method first and the degree method i will guide you through uh, remember for quadrant method you use lead one and lead avf check out lead one shows a prominent negative deflection lead avf shows a prominent positive deflection in our ecg which means this falls in the right axis deviation category right perfect try the degree method also find out a lead which has equiphasic like equal up and down uh, and if you notice out of all of them lead 2 appears to have an equiphasic um, ecg uh, qrs complex uh, equiphasic ka matlab ho jayega uh, line ke upar jitne boxes utne hi line ke niche boxes ya sabse chhota wala it's like upar ka minus niche ka should be zero ke aas pass and you will notice lead 2 has the most equiphasic one if you count the number of boxes above the baseline and number of boxes below the baseline they are almost equal so lead 2 ka perpendicular kon lead 2 ka perpendicular is avl and avl ka direction is from uh, this side from the left side and check out avl it's negative which means you're not seeing it from this side you're actually seeing it from the 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock quadrant which means right axis deviation i hope you've got that correct remember any doubts next session on diabetes that we have on the upcoming sundays you can ask me any doubts from this particular part i will help you out with it okay moving on to other features that we are going to notice here the st appears flat in most of them but some of you might have already noticed that in lead 1 lead 2 lead AV, uh, v1 v2 it seems elevated ab iska kya karne ka well simple see don't see ecg from one perspective don't be like st segment is elevated what if this person has a myocardial infarction remember the three zones that we discussed the zone 1 the outermost zone would be an area of ischemia the second zone would be in area of injury and the third zone would be the area of infarction now if you actually have the notes that i had shared with you on that particular day you can flip to page number 12 just about the table you will notice that i have mentioned what is representing a zone of ischemia t wave inversion what is zone of injury being represented by st segment elevation and what is zone of infarction denoted by a pathological q wave observe in none of these ecgs you find any t wave changes or any other waves that might uh, tell you there's a problem with the ventricle like the qrs complex is normal abhi aisa hota nahi hai generally ki a person has injured myocardium st segment elevation matlab injured myocardium na without having infarction or without having ischemia see minimum injury hone ke liye ischemia to lagega na which means there has to be a t wave change associated with st and because this is an isolated st segment change we will of course correlate clinically but ecg dekhte hue aisa lag to nahi raha ki patient ko koi takleef hogi kyunki agar takleef thi to t wave changes bhi aane chahiye the jo kahin pe bhi dikh nahi rahe right and that's the reason why despite having a little variation in the t wave a little elevated t wave when v1 and v2 uh, we are still going to be like mostly normal ecg are we clear with this ye ecg correlate karo clinically patient has chest pain this may become significant patient does not have chest pain this st segment elevation isolated st segment elevation does not have too much of an importance as far as our diagnosis goes 
the next set of ecgs that i want to do with you guys is uh, well uh, i would like to do some easier ones because you people have really worked hard for the first few ones so uh, let's flip a few pages and i would like you to have a look at ecg number 34 35 36 and 37 remember the beautiful story i shared with you about how a newly married couple husband qrs complex and wife p wave are always together in a normal uh, yeah, you know, marriage a normal ECG, P wave ke baad ek chota sa gap aega, and then you will have QRS complex and the gap between the P wave and the QRS complex will always be same. But in the story, we spoke about how the distance between P wave and QRS complex, the husband and wife slowly and gradually widens. And this means heart blocks. Have a look at ECG number 34. Dekhne absolutely normal lagta hai. There's a P wave, there's a QRS complex, which is narrow complex. There is an upright T wave. I'm telling you this is lead to, just trust me on this one. So this is lead to P wave hai, QRS complex hai, T wave hai, sab kuch normal dikta hai. But when you actually focus, you will notice ki P wave and QRS complex may the number of boxes is too much. It's more than expected, right? Kitna hona chahiye? Three to five boxes. Here it's too much. Which means there is a delay in conduction of impulse between atria and the ventricle. This is type 1 heart block. The reason why we called it type 1 heart block is every P wave is followed by a QRS complex. The P wave appears normal, the QRS complex is normal, but the gap, the time, the gap represents the time, the time taken by the impulse to come from atrium and cross over into the ventricle. The AV node is where the delay is prolonged. And that's why I'm going to call it the type one or the first degree heart block. ECG 35, I think we have solved this in the class again, but focus on P wave, QRS complex, T wave looks normal. P wave is nice, smooth, QRS complex is narrow. T wave is nice, upright wave, but observe the distance between P wave and QRS complex. The first one is about three boxes. The second one is around five boxes. The third one is even more. And the fourth QRS complex does not come only. So there is a gradual increase in the duration, in, in the time between P wave and QRS complex. The duration of PR interval slowly and gradually increases till one QRS complex is dropped. Then it starts all over again. So if you look at uh, the beat, after the missed QRS complex, you will notice P wave and again around three boxes between the P wave and the QRS complex, which is absolutely normal. And then again an increase and increase and then again a dropped QRS complex. This is called a second degree first type heart block. This is also called as Mobitz type one heart block. Look at ECG 36. Hmm. The P wave, not followed by QRS complex, again a P wave, QRS complex, T wave, P wave, not followed by a QRS complex, P wave, followed by a QRS complex, P wave, not followed by. Every alternate beat is missed. But when it comes, the PR interval is absolutely within normal range. This is called as Mobitz type two, or the second type of second degree heart block. Okay. Um, this is a problem with the AV node. All the hard blocks are actually a problem with the AV node. If you recall the story that I told you between husband and wife, things will become easier. And lastly, we have ECG 37, where you see a wide QRS complex. There are P waves. Now at this point of time, if you follow my eight step formula, you will notice the rhythm of P wave is absolutely fine. The rhythm of QRS complex is also absolutely fine. But every P wave is not followed by a QRS complex. P waves are independent of QRS complex. It's as if the P waves, atrial contractions, are not followed by ventricular contraction. This is called as third degree heart block. 
Now that we have finished not one or two, but a total of six different ECGs, I think it's a good time to go out and party. Uh, it's 31st evening. I wish you all the very best for the upcoming new year. Wishing you a happy new year in advance. And I hope to see you in my classes for the next contemporary course for clinicians, which is on diabetes mellitus. It's not going to be a single Sunday topic. We can't finish topic like diabetes in one Sunday. It's going to be a two Sunday topic. One is on 5th of January. The second will be on 12th of January. The timings would be WhatsApp to you very, very soon. So you can enroll for those two Sundays. And more importantly, keep learning in the new year, keep progressing, keep growing. I'll see you in 2020. Till then, have a great time. Bye.